Father, we lift this day to you. We understand the depth of the pains and the sufferings that many, many people go through and many go through in silence. We understand the pervasiveness of grief and of loss. And we ask you to minister to all those present, all those who can't make it and all those who will listen and participate in their own way in the future. Would you minister to us, Holy Spirit? We invite you, Holy Spirit, to be our comforter today, our counsel, our guide in this problematic area, this most difficult of areas. And as you do that, would you help us also to help other people and to be vessels of ministry in our families, our homes, our churches, in the area of grief and of loss. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks again, everybody, for coming along. Um, our, our topic for today is coping with grief and loss. And by that, uh, I'll expand on what I mean by that. Generally, when you say grief, people think about the, the death of a loved one, but it's a much more uh, expansive area than that, much more expansive than that. I'll, I'll explain that in a moment. I think that in terms of training in the church, in terms of training for Christians, this is probably our weakest area. I don't know if there's any area that's more avoided than this area. People just feel awkward about this. They feel awkward about talking about death. They, they, for, for a multitude of reasons, the, the extent of the pain can be so bad, but the lack of training the lack of people doing what you're doing today and taking time to look at this immensely important topic. Jesus was dealing with grief every day. It was a major part. He was always at funerals, right? He was always ministering around death and around loss. And, and, and our failure to train in this area is not good because we end up like Job's comforters. Remember, Job's comforters had no training and no experience. And there was the man with the greatest loss in the Bible. And look at the comforters. They were useless. <laughs> there was four of them. Three of them were useless. And only one of them had any inkling of what he was doing. This is just typical for me. Absolutely typical of what we see in the church. And that's not a criticism. It's an observation. And it's a true observation. Across many nations, this is a weakness. And may God forgive us for that and help us for that. In some ways, it's not intentional. But I thank you for joining us today. And I pray that you yourself receive healing from whatever losses you have suffered or whatever grief you may be coping with. And also that you yourself develop an ever-increasing ability to set other people free in this area. So today I've got three questions I want to ask. How can I help myself through the losses of life? How can I help others? And what are the main do's and don'ts in this in these areas? To do this, I, I, I want to anchor our thoughts today on two principal scriptures. The first one is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 13 where the Apostle Paul is really bringing his thinking to a summary of the, you know, the highs and lows of life. And he comes to almost a kind of a, a midterm conclusion. And it's this. Now, these three things remain. Faith, hope and love. But the greatest of these is love. And it's a really ironic scripture because the three things that death, or loss, attack in my life, are my faith. When someone dies, your faith can be challenged. Mm. Your hope, you could have had hopes tied up in a dream or a, a vision or something you were dreaming of. Your, your faith is challenged, your hope is challenged, and your love can be, you know, in some cases, catastrophically affected, dynamically affected the love because you've lost a loved one. Now, these three things remain. Faith, hope, and love. And if you analyze your trauma and the process of it through grief, you will come to the conclusion, like Paul, that these three things get challenged. And in these three areas, I need to pause and consider a strategic reaction 
to what I'm going through. The second major scripture for me is in Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 12. It says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. Hope deferred makes me grieve. When I was younger, I had all sorts of hopes. Now that I'm older and the years are slipping through my fingers, now that I'm sick, hope deferred makes your heart sick. When our dreams, we realize perhaps in some ways, they will not be fulfilled in the way that we expected. This scripture for me, Proverbs thirteen twelve, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. This scripture for me became a life ring. At the lowest point of my life, I love this scripture. I love it for its balance. I love it for, for its honesty. Because right now, I can be very sick. I'm losing hope. My faith, my hope and my love have been, been affected. And I feel sick. I feel like I'm grieving. But the second part of the scripture, but a longing fulfilled can become a tree of life to you. So God recognizes the traumas and tragedies of grief and loss. In fact, Jesus himself is described as one who is familiar with grief, familiar with it. My soul is sorrowful even unto death, he said. Jesus knew grief more than you do or I do. And it's part of the story of life. Uh, that's just the way it is. I'm going to open with what I think is, 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 is a huge contribution from the Apostle Paul in this area. I'll read it to you. It's from Philippians chapter 3, where he talks about, again, his conclusions around loss. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss <coughs> for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss. Everything, a loss. Because uh, for, for, for Christ's sake, I have lost all things and now I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. So Paul there takes the word loss or grieving, if you like, and he expands it. He opens it up. And I want you to do the same. My first reaction as a young man, if you mentioned loss, I would only think of death. But the Apostle Paul says, I've lost all things. I consider everything a loss. Well, what is everything? Of course, it's the death of a loved one. But it can also be like in my wife's example here, the loss of a career. Mary studied for years, years, all her life, studied incredibly hard to get the qualifications she had. And then she meets me and has to resign and come to another part of the world where she doesn't speak English. It's a grief. It's a loss. Don't underestimate it. I've done many funerals and sat with many people who have experienced loss and are grieving. And this is a truth. This is, I'm not, this is not hyperbole. This is true. One of the most intense pains I have ever sat with, one of the most severe grievings was with a girl who was groaning with pain, aching with pain spluttering and crying profusely with pain. And you know why? Because she didn't get the job. She didn't get a job. And her dreams and her hopes for many years studying. And when she got her breath back, she said to me, I've been studying all my life. My parents sacrificed for my training. And this was, and she just wasn't good enough in the area that she targeted for her own career. And she didn't get professional employment in it. And it was a grief. It was a huge grief. But I remember that happened to me when I was a very young pastor. And I can remember my eyes just opening like the, the dawn, the sun. And I thought, oh, my Lord, grief is much more pervasive than I ever thought. Yes, we grieve the death of loved ones. Of course we do. But you can also lose your career. You can lose your dreams. You can lose a relationship. We're dealing with several different countries just like this. <coughs> Excuse me. Where people currently, because of lockdown, thank God not so much in London, but in other nations, uh, almost on a weekly basis, we're having to intervene where relationships are falling apart. And that can be a great loss and a great 
grief. You can lose your health. This happened, my best friend. You know, very sad. When I was with him, not long before he died, he died of cancer. And he was my closest mate for years. And he was in his hospital bed. He was grey. He had turned as grey as grey as grey can be. The greyest grey you've ever seen because of chemotherapy. And I was leaving and I said, okay, see you in the morning. I'll be back tomorrow. And his, some of his last words to me, he said, Mike, I just want to be healthy without trying. Just like you. He was watching me skip away, walk out the door, go outside. Imagine being able to go outside. I remember that. The loss of your health can be a devastating grief, a devastating loss. And how are you going to respond to that? Are we prepared to respond to that? The loss of my wealth. I've used Jeffrey Archer as an example. Great example of someone who lost everything but had the ability, had the built-in coping mechanisms, not only to survive, but to thrive, to come back stronger. Great example. And I believe the same, you know, resurgence that you see in Jeffrey Archer, who I don't think is a Christian even, by the way, um, the same resurgence and, 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 and thriving that you see with Jeffrey Archer, you can see in any of these areas, whether it's death, whether it's career, whether it's dreams, whether it's relationships, and I echoed the voice of C.S. Lewis, one of the most famous Christians of all time, who, when his wife Joy died, one of his first books was Surprised by Joy. Wonderful title, because in the book he explains, when Joy came into his life, she was a joy. She was a total joy, full of energy, full of life, happiest girl he'd ever met. So he married her. And then she died. <coughs> and he goes on to explain that he never thought he could recover. Never thought he could come out of that. But in the book, he says he was surprised by joy because long after she died, his joy became resurgent and his life became far better than he had ever expected. In fact, he states that the level of his joy was higher than it had ever been, even after her death. Quite astonishing. Another thing that we can lose is our reputation. You can lose your reputation by extreme failure, you make a big mistake and goodness knows there's enough examples of that around. But you can lose your reputation by character assassination in your workplace, in your family, in your church. People can say things about you. That's a loss. That's a grief. Mm -hmm. That's a pain that needs to be recognized. And one of the most irretrievable losses that we're all in, my friends, is age. Age, you know, time and tide will not be stopping for you. You're going to get older just like everybody else. And those years ticking by can have a negative or they can have a positive effect. So my first point to you today, loss can occur in all of these areas. And I want to be able to, to see it in my life and in the life of those I help, in the life of my family or my friends or those who come to me for help. If I'm going to help them, I need to have a handle on it myself first, right? So step one in this process, I need to accept that someone else may be experiencing pain or may not be. They may not be at a level that you personally can never comprehend. <coughs> to be honest with you, I am not obsessed with my career. I never was. I was a mental health nurse. I loved my job. I left my job to go into ministry, but I didn't grieve. I didn't grieve. I wasn't crying like that lady who lost her, who didn't get the job. But I must understand that I can't project my intensity onto someone else. Her grief is genuine to her and I can't take that from her. I, I um, Some of you will be listening to this for the first time and you've never met me, but I, I lost my first wife some years ago. And throughout that entire experience, I learned how little the church understands about this area. I was constantly presented with the expectations of people. Some people thought I was too happy. Some people think you're too sad. <laughs> you can't please people, you know. 
The expectations, the projections of society, the projections of others, many of whom have never trodden this road. So I would say my advice to you at this point, let other people endure and go through whatever experience they're going through. It's highly, highly subjective. In other words, it's just in their world and you need to give them that space and recognize that. The second thing that I think is a very important point, not all losses happen because of death or the, 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 the traumas of life. Many losses happen by choice. That's what the Apostle Paul said. I have chosen to lose all things. I have ch you have chosen to leave your career. <clears throat> so choices can come at us really in a multitude of ways. By choice, I can choose to lose things. It can be a complete surprise. That's not good. <laughs> or it can happen by force, like the wrenching of a loved one out of your life. It can be a force. So choice comes in many different ways. And we need to accept that and realize the nature of our response may be different. I have to say, over the years, having worked with so many pastors intimately, I found some pastors to be very bitter, very bitter in themselves. You pick it up, you know, you pick almost a resentment within them for being in the ministry. And you, I, I think, what is that? What are you angry about? I sense an underlying unhappiness. Here you are serving the Lord. And I really, I put my finger on it one day when one of my disciples, who was a very mature Christian, was giving me a very hard time. And I was looking at them thinking, what's eating you? <laughs> what's eating you? I didn't say it, but they're not a happy person. What's eating you? And suddenly, you know, out of the mouth, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And suddenly they, they said, you know, I've given up many things in my life and you're going to. Oh, oh, there you go. There you go. You've made the choice to sacrifice certain things in your life in order to go forward in ministry. But actually, you're bitter about that. You're bitter about the, the actual sacrifices you have had to make. You need to deal with that. The Apostle Paul says, I now look at everything like a loss and I, I'm able to accept it for the sake of Christ. I'm not going to get bitter over it. I made the sacrifice. I made the choice. My brother, as I say, is a Catholic priest. So he took the vow of celibacy as a young man, 17 in our home. I'm sure he had to work through many negative thoughts about that pledge, that vow over the years when he was 22, 25, 30, 35, and not let it make him bitter because of his very own sacrificial choices. The third thing <coughs> I would say, and this is getting more technical, but generally speaking, those who study this area professionally around the world, they, they tell us it's good for us to try and get some sort of structure in our mind to the progressive nature of the outworking of grief for whatever that grief, the reason that grief may have come. It's good for us to get a general uh, you know, compass of, of the, the, the emotions, the emotional roller coaster that most people go through. This is not a requirement. You know, you don't have to go through these experiences chronologically, but they are, gen they, they are generally speaking the typical human reactions. And I don't know about you, but I'm a pretty typical human being. The first one is denial. There's nothing wrong. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. How are you? Are you sure? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> denial. In my first pastorate, <coughs> I had... Two members who lived three houses down. I was a mother and her son. And the father had died. And that, that family had one joy in their life, and it was their dog. They loved that dog, I tell you. They loved that dog. What, they went to the shop one day, and I was sitting in the living room, two doors away, when I heard car brakes go. Err! And I went out. 
and the dog was dead and they were at the shop. So I picked the little dog up, a tiny little dog. I put it in a shoebox. I covered it with a tea towel and then I had to wait until they came home. Denial, you know. And I waited and with great dread, I went and knocked the door and the son came to the door. Oh, hello, Pastor Mike. I said, hello, I, I uh, was some bad news today, I'm afraid. A little dog got out on the road when you were away and car hit him and he got killed. And there was about a three second pause. And then that boy screamed at me, no, he didn't. And slammed the door in my face. <laughs> no, he didn't. This is a lie. This is not true. And denial, a denial of reality is a way of human beings from shielding the pain. The pain for that boy who was slightly handicapped, by the way. The pain for that boy of losing his little treasure is so much of a shock that the human system, the psyche has protective mechanisms built in. And that's okay, as long as you don't stay there. It can't become a permanent place. It's a temporary defense mechanism to stop you collapsing. A few minutes later, his mother came running down the street because I left him to digest the information. And uh, we were able to resolve that situation. The second stage, the first stage normally is perhaps an attempt at some form of denial. The second can be anger. Sadly, when I pastored in Dublin, we buried many drug addicts. Many were attached to our church. And one of the most harrowing things was a father, a very rich man, actually. And his son, we had worked with multiple times. We tried to help him with cold turkeys, but his son eventually overdosed. And we buried his son. But I'll never forget the screams of the father at the graveside. And he just said one word. Why? 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 He was just furious, screaming with anger. Anger is an emotion. And you as a human being may be unable to process the reasons and that's perfectly normal and you that can make you angry almost demanding an answer of God I don't recommend you do that I don't do that God doesn't owe me an answer for anything and that's a very good place to be in but the anger is almost like a demand on God the third is bargaining and bargaining basically means <coughs> I don't like comparing this to Christ, but when, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, facing the greatest grief of his life, the greatest loss of his life, the cross, Father, is there any way, is there any way that this cup can be taken from me? Is there any way that we can figure this out another way? Can I, can I bargain with you on this almost? You know, And this is a basic human instinct. Does it have to be like this? God? Does it have to be? Is there anything I can do if I do this or do that? And, you know, bargaining can be somewhat irrational, to be honest, around loss. But it's, a, again, a natural human reaction. So denial, anger, bargaining, and fourthly, depression. And by depression, I know this is a negative term, or at least it's perceived largely in a negative connotation. But I don't mean depression as a medical condition. That's a completely different issue. People who have depression as a condition, they're depressed. They don't need a reason. That's what depression is. It's a condition for some, sadly. But it can also be almost an emotional state. Grief is a better word to use. It's a, it's a better word to use. But as a Christian, you can be in a temporary emotional state of feeling incredibly low. And I don't want to minimize that. Or hyper-spiritualize that. I say, oh, you're not depressed. You're this. Well, they could well be depressed for the moment. At this moment of their time. So be considerate of that. And once we come through those roller coasters, which takes as long as it takes, hopefully we emerge with some degree of acceptance. And the arrival at the station called acceptance is going to be a very different arrival time for everybody. So you just got to let each person travel their own journey and deal with their own baggage. I would add to the list my own additions. So officially, you've got denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. But I would add guilt. Guilt is a major factor for many people. 
after death? Did I do enough? Did I love enough? Why didn't I visit? Why wasn't I there for the last few years of my, my loved one's life? All of those things, things they've said, things I've done, things I didn't do. Guilt. <coughs> Shock is a huge emotion. Fear, bitterness, confusion. And to be honest, for me, dislocation is a big one. Dislo feeling dislocated, like a dislocated arm that doesn't function. With the loss of a spouse, particularly, dislocation and learning to grow another arm, if you like, is quite an agonizing process, a very necessary process. But I must accept that I am truly dislocated. <laughs> All that I was connected to is gone. I would add to my depression point, please remember, it's okay to grieve. Okay, Jesus wept. It's okay to grieve, but don't get stuck in any depression. Grief is a gift from God. You can process the agonies of life. Grief is okay. But depression is, is never okay, really. Don't linger in that place. Push your way out of it. Now, our responses as pastors, as leaders in this area, the typical responses, we're to exercise love and care and empathy if we can, sympathy if we cannot. We're to give understanding and space. Giving that understanding is more difficult perhaps than you realize. And the reason is the way cultures deal with death is incredibly different. It could not be more different. My next door neighbor, when I was a child, I was about 15. She was murdered in Belfast by an explosion in our street. And I used to go in there all the time. And I remember when uh, and her husband and her three children were in there. And after she died, she was killed. I was going in as normal and my mother screamed at me, don't go in that house. Mm -hmm. What? Don't go in that house. You give space to people to grieve. You give space and you give time to people to grieve. You don't invade that space. And yet in other cultures, it's the complete opposite. So be aware, especially in international churches, the expectations traditionally in your culture may be completely different if you've moved to another country. Mm. So you have to give space for that. Those expectations may never be met and you can end up grieving over that. <laughs> That's not very wise. Understand there's a big world out there with very different expectations and very different expressions and coping mechanisms. Mm. The biggest do's and don'ts, the do's when dealing with your own loss and take this from me, <laughs> I consider myself to be someone who has recovered from loss. Someone who has gone, someone who demanded the time to go through my suffering, whether you like it or not. And many people thought I was too happy. Many people thought I was too sad. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. I am going to take my time. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take my time. I remember my driving instructor when I was a young man saying, we need to put your test next week. I said, no. And he said, well, I think you're ready. Well, I think I'm not. Well, I think, well, I think I'm not. I'll tell you the time. I'll tell you. I passed first time, by the way. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> and, and you need to, you know, nobody knows you like you. And these people are projecting on you expectations that they have no entitlement to. Don't fall for that trap. You take your time. Talking about it is good when you're ready. When you're ready. I went, my wife, my first wife died. And because of the funeral restrictions and the problems, there was a six week delay in the funeral. So six weeks, what am I going to do for six weeks? <laughs> And the RMD meeting was next week in Singapore. So I didn't know what to do. Six weeks. So I said, you know what? I may as well just go to the RMD meeting. What's the point in sitting here? So I went. And there's like 16 men sitting in the room. <coughs> Rick Seward's one of the wisest men I ever met. You need to talk about it when you're ready. So I go to Singapore. I'm sitting in the RMD meeting. And morning, everybody. The meeting's about to start. Silence, please. 
You need to talk about it when you're ready. Now, my wife is in a freezer. We haven't even had the funeral yet. And Rick opens up the meeting and he says, good morning, everybody. And good morning, Mike. Now, let's get on with the meeting. Very wise. Very, 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 very wise. For me, one of the wisest thing I ever see him do. Very clever. It's not good to try and even talk about that. Five days, six days after the death of a spouse, just leave that guy. He can make that decision. He's perfectly capable of that. But right now, we're just going to get on with our work. Very good. Very, very good wisdom. The biggest do's. Take your time. Talk about it when you're ready. Jumping in there too early, I don't think is helpful for anybody. I would advise to help others. Helping others is a wonderful, 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 wonderful thing. <clears throat> I shared this testimony before, but I'll share it for those joining us for the first time. But I, I, I was once again, not long, I suppose about one year after my first wife died, I was coming into land in Glasgow. Now, this is the truth. I had never given officially, if you like, my suffering and my pain to Christ for his glory, like Paul says. I now consider it lost for your sake. And it hit me like a revelation, actually, not just an awareness, a revelation on that plane. Oh, God, forgive me. So on the plane, I sat in my seat and I said, God, I give you my experiences for your glory. I give you my pain. Use it. Use it. And I got off the plane very late at night and I got in a taxi and I was heading home and I said to the taxi driver, is this your last journey? And he snapped at me angry. Well, what does it matter to you if it's my last year? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> so I just went quiet, you know. And a little while later, he said, I'm sorry about that. Sorry. And I said, it's okay. Are you okay? And I said, no, I'm not okay. But the problem is nobody understands my problem. So I said, well, actually, I'm a pastor. <laughs> What's your problem? And he said, it's my wife. She's seriously ill. She's probably going to die. And I look after her at home. But who understands this problem? I said, well, <coughs> I just did eight years of that, you know. So when we got to my house, we got out of the taxi. And both of us stood there in the darkness late at night. And he just took everything he could. I think that was probably the best taxi drive of his life. Helping others is incredibly cathartic incredibly therapeutic and I would strongly advise you to ask God to give you those opportunities the biggest things to do take your time talk about it help others and for heaven's sake stay healthy I would put this way up there watch your diet do some exercise your body soul and spirit and if you disrespect that if you get hyper spiritual here you may pay a bigger price for that than you think Running, go running, go to the gym, do some exercise, physical exercise. Uh, I ju Just take my word for it. Just trust me in this one, okay? Just do it because people never want to do this. Change your diet and get it. You have to do both because you won't do one. If you don't do one, you won't do the other. Change your diet and exercise at the same time and you'll start to feel your very body. You know what? Listen, guys. See when I go for a run. Do you know what my body says to me? Mike, you've got a long life. Mike, you're going somewhere. Mike, you, this fitness is because you've got something ahead. When I'm eating a good dinner, this is because I've got something to do with my life. When I'm eating McDonald's and I'm lying on the sofa, do you know what my brain says to me? You're finished. There's no point for you anymore. You're done. And you need to, David said he, he encouraged himself in the Lord. After Elijah faced the greatest grief of his life, remember? Elijah, he said, I want to die. He was suicidal. You remember what he did. He ate, diet, he slept, he got control of his clock and his sleeping patterns, and then he went for a run for 40 days, running and exercise. These things change our mentality from depression and getting stuck in the moment to your body telling you to move on. So don't get hyper spiritual on me. Take your time, talk about it, help others, stay healthy. And you're going to have to connect. <coughs> the biggest thing that 
you lose in death is connection. It's the word connection. And it was my stepdaughter who really helped me with this point. Uh, so Jeanette's her mum. But in the same year, her husband left her and left her with six children. And we spent many hours together just talking about the death of her, her mum and then also the loss of her husband. And one day she just said it to me. And again, it was revelation to me. She said, Mike, do you know what we've lost? Connection. And it's just, that's it. I don't connect with anybody like I did with Jeanette. And you know, from the day I was born until the day I met you, there's only been two people in my whole life that I ever connected with. The first one was Jeanette. And after Jeanette, no one, no one, no woman, and I know many, no men, no churches, no Christians, no family, no brother, no sister, no nothing. I can spend time, but it's not the same thing. I can spend time, but I'm not connected in the way I was. And she sent me one scripture, bang. Soon as I read that, it was actually an admonishment. Who do you think you are admonishing me? <laughs> she was admonishing me and she didn't even know me. I was quite surprised at that. But that scripture slapped me in the head. And I remember that day like it was yesterday. I remember saying to myself, no one has ever hit me with a scripture like that than my first wife. And that's why I immediately started to talk to her. There's a connection between you and me. This is a divine connection and we're going to talk. When you lose a mother, a father, a brother, a sister, a career that you are connected with your passion for your ministry, you've lost a ministry, you've lost your health, whatever it is, you need to be aware that if you isolate yourself, how are you going to make those connections? You need to reconnect. Here we are in a Zoom group. The people who most need to be here, they're not here. <laughs> they're not connected. They're unaware of the things they're losing, unaware of that. And just understanding that point of the need to open up to your future again and to reconnect with the church, reconnect with other human beings. And God will bless you in that. <coughs> By the way, um, <coughs> excuse me, my last point under the things to do, eventually you do need to open up to the future if you've ever had nerve trouble with your teeth, toothache can be agonizing. If you have a toothache, it's excruciating. But you know, all you need to do with the toothache is you just get a little bit of clove oil. That's all, just a little bit of clove oil. And you just put that clove oil on your tooth. It's just a miracle. Bang! Isn't that amazing? The power of that thing. Clove oil can remove nerve ending pain in teeth and it can do so powerfully. So when I'm talking about finding a connection, the connection needs to take away my pain. I'm sorry for being personal, but if it's ever pertinent, today is the day when it's pertinent. So when I lost Jeanette, I, I, I know many girls, many, many girls in many countries, and many of them would send me message and everything else. And I would look at the message and I would say, you're not my clove oil. <laughs> because you don't take away my pain. Next, no, you're not my clove oil because you don't take away my pain. I will know the right person because the right person is the antidote that God sends. Don't, don't go for a subsidy. Don't go for a false replacement. Wait, wait. The right person, and when we're talking about the loss of a spouse here, the right person is the one who takes away your pain. That's the right person. And you need to wait for that. That's the, God's gift in that scenario. They're the biggest do's. The biggest do nots in helping others. Please don't talk. <laughs> but listen. Listen. The worst thing people say when they're trying to help you with your grief and your loss, which they don't normally understand because they're not you. Oh, I know, 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 I know. You probably don't know. You probably don't know. And you, because you're not that person. 
So try to listen. And you don't know what you don't know. If you've never been there, don't be afraid of that. Don't be afraid to admit, I, I, I have no idea what you're going through. I've never been in your situation. And it's a time, the things not to do, I don't need your autobiography. I don't need to know your story. If you're coming to counsel me, don't tell me about you, okay? I don't need an autobiography at the time of death. Just let the person be. And ultimately, a death situation, when you're visiting someone who's lost, lost a mum or a dad or a spouse or a child, your visit's not about you. So don't start getting upset because you expected to do something for them or to be something for them that you seemingly are not permitted to be. I had people, many people offended with me over the, the, the dealing of the way I had to bury Jeanette because of the delays and everything else, making the issue about them. Well, they haven't lost anybody. <laughs> we needed to do this, this way. And, the, and they take offense. And, you know, ministers can be really bad on this. Churches, pastors, disciples, they can really get the wrong perspective. Maybe your help is not needed, friend. Maybe your help is not wanted. Hard to swallow that for some people. And some people insist on helping. And then when you're in a crisis situation, you say, do you mind, actually, I can't meet you today because we're organizing the, the, the coffin. Oh, you don't want my help. And suddenly they're offended and they're making the situation about who? About them. That's, that's ministry coming from your own needs. You have the need to be needed. That's your problem. You need to be needed. You want to be wanted. You shouldn't minister from that basic need. That's not healthy. This is about them. It's not about you. So if you want my help, I'm here. If you don't, that's not a problem. We're going to be praying for you anyway. Let me say a few words about the expectations of reaction. And, and this is something that is incredibly crazy to even have to mention it. <coughs> in one week, in one church, I had one woman who lost her husband and another woman who lost her baby. The woman who had lost her husband went into total panic and fear and emotional collapse in front of the whole church. In front of the whole church. This was her way of dealing with it. Screaming in the church as were her family. The woman who lost her baby had the opposite response. She was dancing in that building on the same day, dancing around the front. Hallelujah. God is, you know, God is the God of life and death, blah, blah, blah. Totally different reactions. And then after that particular weekend came many discussions, many arguments. This person's wrong for dancing. This person's wrong for crying. <laughs> Jesus said, we, uh, we sang a funeral song. You weren't happy. We danced. You weren't happy, right? How true is it? But the fact is, in that situation, both of these people are entitled to their own expression. Leave them alone and stop projecting your expectations on other people. It's not about you. It's about them. Leave them alone. And I would say, actually, to be honest, they both did well in the end. It's the, it's the congregations that project those expectations. Types of death make a difference. The manner of the death, it makes a difference to the way the grief is experienced. You can have a natural death, like my father when he was 95. Very painful, I have to say, but at least it was natural and he had a long life. You can have an accident. You can have a murder. You can have a suicide. You can have a death slow or a death fast. And the grieving is very different in all of these situations. You need to be very aware of that, but people are not aware of this at all. I have a friend, a very long-term pastor friend, his name is, is Daniel. And he went to bed one night when he was 34. And his wife, who he loved passionately, and when he woke up in the morning, she was dead. Sudden, no warning, totally healthy. Shock of all shocks. So here's a question. 
When does the grieving process begin for him? Well, it's a shock. So the grieving process pretty much begins now. We enter the process. Now, then you think of someone like me, okay? So Jeanette got Alzheimer's disease, which is a degenerative disease. So she started to disappear about eight years before her actual death. So at what point did I start to grieve? Eight years before. She was almost gone in four years or five years. She wasn't there and then physically disappeared. So for me, in the last two or three years, like when I came to LFC, for example, many people say, you need to grieve. And I wouldn't answer because it's a lack of understanding about the nature of the grief process. For me, the grief process started a long time ago. And to be honest, in this chronic situation, death is a relief. Death is a release because of the chronic nature of the illness. However, for, so I'm at the end of my grief and coming into restoration, actually because of the duration. But someone like Daniel, he's at the beginning of his grief because it was a sudden death. So you need to, don't project your expectations on other people. Step back from the situation and try and get a wide angle lens that grief most truly is a process. And the types of death, the manner of death and the duration of that suffering process has an implication. It has an implication on the stage of grief that any person you're trying to minister to may be at. I could give you many more examples on this. I've got many here before me, but I won't for the sake of time. Another point <coughs> to appreciate is what I would call the compound factor. That when you're dealing with people, I think of Tanaya as a good example. May God bless her. She's in uh, Africa at the moment because her brother has just died. Her mother died just five minutes ago. Tanaya is a classic example of pain upon pain. Not only have I suffered this, but now I'm suffering this and this and this. This type of person for me needs to be particularly careful. And when you have the pains of life multiplied, I was talking to Jeremy Seward about this just a couple of weeks ago. The, the, the attack that we're under as churches is multiplied and the very multiplication factor is the attack. <laughs> that is the nature of the, the, the diversity. If you give me one problem, I can deal with it. Give me 20 at the same time and my head's spinning. And then I become even more vulnerable. And so the compound factor can affect grief. And by that, I mean when you're suffering more than one grief at the same time. I read this scripture where Jesus was talking to Peter. Um, uh, and he says, do you love me? He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved. There you go. There's your grief. Peter was grieved because the Lord had said to him a third time, do you love me? And then he said, Lord, you know all things. Why are you saying this? Verse 18, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted to go. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you, you, where you don't want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was going to glorify God. And after saying this, he said, turn and uh, he said, follow me. But verse 20, Peter turned and saw the other disciple who was following them. And he turns to Jesus and says, well, what about him? <laughs> now, let me just look at the camera a moment. Let me just really, this is really very important point for me. First of all, you're almost insinuating that I don't love you. I'm hurt, man. I'm hurt. You hurt me today. I love you. I've given up everything for you. What you're saying is really, really, I've really grieved over this, Jesus. Oh, and secondly, you're going to be crucified. What? Come on. Come on. What next? Anything else? Oh, and look at this guy bobbing down the road. Happy John. What about him? Just me, is it? Just me going to be crucified? So my point is the compound factor turns Peter from a sacrificial leader to a victim. The pain upon pain, he's doing well, he's following Jesus, so far so good. But once you're starting to add layers of suffering, now I'm a victim, am I? And now he wants to know what's going to happen to everybody else. Once you start comparing yourself to everybody else, that's a classic telltale sign, you've become a victim. I'm not like them, I'm not like, and by the way, that's a total deception. Everybody, so everybody has their own form of suffering in life. 
So be very careful. Peter's history affected his reaction. And I would warn you in dealing with people <coughs> and you see someone and perhaps something happens, maybe the loss of a dog, like I just explained. And it's very easy for me to look at the extreme pain and judge that, not realizing the pain upon pain, not realizing the history. So one person's reaction to one suffering may be at one level and another person's may be at a different level because of their history. Do you understand that? Very important. They could have a long history of pain and suffering. And so you have to appreciate that and give them that space to grieve as they feel fit. I'm coming close to the end of this part. But for me, what one of the most powerful scriptures is in the book of Ezekiel. Um, and God wanted to use Ezekiel as an example for the nations because their hope had become in their, in their walls, in their powerful city walls. But we were talking this morning, and, and probably for me, the Bible's best example of grief actually is Ezekiel. So if you want to study grief, Job and Ezekiel, these two. Uh, Ezekiel was phenomenal. Israel had lost their faith in God. Their eyes, instead of looking up, were looking down. They were looking at the walls, the powerful walls. And Ezekiel had one delight in his life, and that was his wife. She, it says, was the delight of his eyes. But he was the prophet. So God does an amazing thing. He visits Ezekiel and he says, Ezekiel, I need to turn the people back to me. And they all know you. So tonight, I'm going to take the life of your wife. And they will see your hope removed and put in heaven. And in the same day, I'm going to knock down the walls of the city because your hope is in her and their hope is in the walls. I want them to turn to me. What an occasion. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man. This is God speaking. With one blow, I am about to take away from you the delight of your eyes. Yet do not lament. So you're going to lose your wife, but don't cry. See the expectations? <laughs> Yet do not lament. Don't shed any tears. If you're going to groan, groan quietly. Don't mourn for the dead. Keep your turban fastened on your head, your sandals on your feet. Don't cover your moustache. None of the traditional customary mourning. I don't want you to do that. So I spoke to the people in the morning and in the evening my wife died. The next morning I did as I felt right. I grieved the way I wanted to. I grieved the way was, uh, was correct for me. And then the people asked me, why won't you tell us what these things have to do with us? Why are you acting like this? See the judgment and the expectations. Ezekiel was incredibly obedient. Absolutely phenomenal biblical character. Do you understand what's happening? Where your treasure is, there your heart will be. So God took his treasure put his treasure in heaven and Ezekiel started to look up and the nation followed the prophet, looking onto God, not trusting in the walls like they shouldn't be anyway. That's what was happening in that situation. So the loss of your loved ones, as people around you observe you, make sure that you're heavenly focused. Make sure that you become a light to those around you, focusing on God and following your treasure in heaven where your loved ones are. Are. This is how we can use our suffering for good. I need to say a few words about difficult questions. There are many difficult questions that arise and make the situation very awkward around death, particularly the death of loved ones or others. One of the biggest difficult questions is, did my mom go to heaven? <laughs> did my father go to heaven? And that's something that we need to ask ourselves you know, ju just pause a moment and don't get dragged in to that conversation as such. Um, don't feel pressurized to, 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 to answer a question like that. I get asked that question many, many times. Pastor, do you think my brother went to heaven? And my answer is always the same. I am not Jesus Christ. I am not God. I'm not in the place of God. There's a future judgment day for me and for you and for all your family. And the Bible tells us, do not say in your heart who will descend below or who will rise on high. That is not your role. That is not your decision. That is not your job. Rather, look after yourself. 
Cling to God yourself. Pursue God yourself. You are not the judge of other people's eternity. The second question is, if God is good, why did my father suffer? Why did my sister suffer? Why did this happen? Why did that happen? Well, this is an endless question and you need to be careful. If the Bible doesn't give crystal clear answers to something, don't you try to give an answer to it. Don't you try to answer something the Bible doesn't answer clearly. Suffering is in this world. Suffering is part of this. Jesus suffered. Okay. So you can criticize Jesus all you want for suffering. But the one thing's for sure, this is a God who takes his own medicine. This is a God who suffers more than you. So we would need to appreciate that and accept that. David, by the way, in terms of why do we suffer? David asks this question endlessly in the Psalms. Why do the wicked prosper? When, why does the evil men succeed in their ways when I who walk after you, you know, suffer so much? Why did they not suffer? So David is asking the same question. Job asked the question multiple times. I have done nothing wrong, so why am I suffering? So the question is okay. The question is common. I'm just, my only advice to you, don't try and give uh, answers to questions that the Bible at this point of history leaves pretty much open. The last page, and then I'm going to hand over to each of you and give you the opportunity, if you wish, to share whatever you choose. But I've given you 12 suggestions for coping with personal loss. Number one, be patient with yourself. Number two, be gentle and be kind to yourself. Don't beat yourself up. No good in that. <coughs> Number three. In and around the time of loss or bereavement or grief, it's not a good time to be making big decisions. Not a good time to be making life-changing decisions. Four, allow yourself time and space to grieve. Five, develop skills to deal with grief. I love this point. This is what I did. Go and investigate, study, study the subject, learn from other people. Take the best out of it so you yourself can also move on. Number six, maybe take a grief holiday. <laughs> you could intentionally say, I've been suffering. I've been crying for the last six months. I'm Next week, I'm going to go and do some. I'm going to break out of this cycle because it can become almost, almost like a habit, a negative habit. So mm -hmm. try and intentionally put things where you're, you're, you're going to push over that line. Number seven. Seek support from those who are not going to tell you how to grieve. Now, this is what Job, this, Job's a great example. They're called Job's comforters for a reason because they were useless. <laughs> Seek support from people who are not going to presume that they can tell you how to grieve because it's probably not going to help you. That's the lesson of the book of Job. Number eight, accept that your life may be a little bit crazy for the next little while. Your life may be upside down. You may be complete mess. I tell you, I've been there, been there, done that. <laughs> I know I'm a little bit crazy at the moment, but I still got my faith and my hope and my love getting rekindled inside me. I know I might not look good today. Amen. Accept that your life may be a little bit crazy for the moment, but I may be in this place today, but I ain't going to be staying here. No, sir, I ain't staying here. But I accept my moment. I accept it. Everybody gets a little bit of a mess sometimes. Number nine, try and find meaning through your suffering. And I would just, again, echo Surprised by Joy, one book by C.S. Lewis and another one uh, is called A Grief Observed. It's on the same subject, but it's equally good book, A Grief Observed. And number 10, finally, maintain very high self-care. Look after the shepherd. Strike the shepherd and everything else is going to fall apart. Look after yourself. The Bible says about Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, Solomon established who? Himself. That's how it introduces Solomon. Wisest man who ever lived, he established himself. Established myself mentally. Established myself physically with health. Established myself spiritually with declarations and confessions. And through these things, I can not only endure, not only survive, but thrive. Final statement. As I studied this several years back, <coughs> I studied this subject in great detail. 
I found two people who are considered the world's leading experts at this moment, David Kessler and Elizabeth Ross, and they've written various books. And very interesting to me, they've also got some online seminars you can do. Very interesting question in a questions and answers session, which we're going to have in a moment. One of the crowds said, it was to Elizabeth Ross, excuse me, I've suffered in my life. I've suffered beyond my ability to even express it, and I don't want to talk about it. But could you answer me this question, Mr. Expert? What's the point? What is the point in what I've been through? Is there a point? And I thought the answer was fantastic. And the answer of both of these experts was this. Yes, there is a point. Experience. The experiences that you have just been through make you a completely different person. Now, they can make you better. Be careful that you don't take that road. They're intended to make you a much better person, much more empathetic, much more understanding, a much better minister. And I mean that in the broadest sense, as a minister to your children, to your family, and of course in churches. It's intended to change you. We do many online Zooms now with different churches across Europe. And for the last many months, we've been dealing with one individual who's lost everything. That's all I'll say. He's lost everything in the last few months. Everything that you can think of. Yeah, that's right. Everything. He's lost everything. He's a friend of mine and a minister. And I think it was last week or the week after mm. I was saying to him, you know, OK, so it's all gone, man. So what's this all going to be about? What's it all about, huh? And I said to him, I would propose to you that this can make you a better person. I would propose to you that you're now much more valuable than you ever were before. Back then, you were just a normal guy. But now, look at the experience you've had. You know, he nearly jumped off his seat and he said, that's right. That's right. That is exactly right. Look at what I've learned. I've learned about my family. I've learned about the church. I learned so much about myself. Things I never knew before. I'm different now. And then I could see the fear gripping him that no one would understand. And so I entered. Eventually, you can talk. You speak when you're ready. Right now, you're going through the, under, the, the process, incredible pain. You're going through the moral and emotional transformation. And eventually, my friend, all of this one day can have purpose. If you let the chief doctor here, if you let the master take a hold of you, he can make something majestic out of this mess. Father, we commit these words to you, these thoughts and these insights. And I pray they would just take root in every individual listening. Bless them, one and all. Help us to accept and not hide our problems in loss and grief, in relationships, in loved ones, in careers, in health, wherever that loss may be. We accept our reality under your good hand. Help us make the best out of this. For all things, all things work together for good for those who know you and are called according to your purpose. And I pray that scripture in reality right now in the name of Jesus for every person listening that all things, good and bad, that you have suffered all things that you've been through, good and bad, will now be used for good as we give way to you to come and heal us and move us forward to the next version of ourselves. We ask this in Jesus' name.